all across the state and um, wonderful ministry uh, and I can get you some more info on that if you would like but uh, hurry to visit their website uh, and it's on our partnership page if you go to our, on our website to the ministry partners you can click on it any of our partners and go to their websites and see what they're doing uh, tonight tonight at six o'clock is the community Thanksgiving service be held at the Gallatin United Methodist Church uh, just right around the corner over here and um, it'll be at 6 p.m. Um, I'll be participating in that and I hope you'll join us it's a great time when the community kind of comes together uh, the body of Christ comes together and just lifts him up we will not meet this coming Wednesday night obviously for small group but on December 2nd we're going to study the Philemon uh, just a real short book, going to be a one-night study, or as the little boy said once, oh, we're going to study Philemon. And, uh, but that's uh, a week from Wednesday night. We'll meet in our regular small groups. Then on December the 9th, we will meet here and have our Christmas banquet. And uh, we're going to have some ham, and there's a sign-up sheet for all the sides, desserts, and things in the back. So how good is it going to be? As good as you want to make it. Okay? <laughs> And, uh, you know, if the Lord lays on you to bring coconut pie, that's fine, too. Uh, <laughs> December calendars are in the back, and uh, feel free to avail yourself of those. But I can tell you that following the banquet, 16th, 23rd, and 30th, those Wednesday nights, we're going to take off. And uh, we'll meet on Sunday mornings as usual. Then, beginning in January, we will study Galatians. So, uh, looking forward to... Uh, Good holiday season and looking forward to a bright new year. Okay. Well, this morning I want to address the discipline that will set you free. There's a discipline that's rather been lost in Christian life, and I think particularly lost in our day, and it's particularly uh, this time of year we ought to talk about it, and that is the discipline of being thankful. Now that may sound trite to you, but I can tell you that the person who is a Christ follower who truly builds an attitude of being thankful into their heart and life so that whatever comes their way, they're giving thanks. I can tell you that's a person who rises above their circumstances and sees the victory that God has for them. And that's what he has for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 19 Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. How many of you have ever heard someone say, well, I've just really struggled knowing God's will? Yeah. Ever heard that? Ever been there? Of course we have. Well, you know, I've always said, if you want to know God's will, Start by doing the things that you know are his will. And then if you're faithful in that, he will give, reveal more to you. And this, we know, is the will of God. That in every circumstance, we should be giving thanks. Now you say, well, there's some bad things going on. You know, I'm thankful that today a church is open to Paris that's been closed for a long time. Now, I'm not giving thanks for violence. I'm not giving thanks for murder. But boy, I'm giving thanks for what God is bringing out of it. As we look back on Thanksgiving, all I was taught in school was that they had a good first harvest, and so they had a feast and gave thanks. That's pretty much what I was taught about the pilgrims. What about you? Is that about it? That's about all I was taught. Well, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. Those pilgrims had, been, had fled England and lived in the Netherlands so they could worship as they pleased. But because of crafts guilds in the Netherlands, they were uh, destined to work menial labor jobs, weren't really accepted. And the trappings of a better life in the Netherlands began to draw their young people away and so they thought they couldn't handle that anymore so they needed to find a new place to live where they could truly have freedom and truly worship as they saw fit. And so they were going to sail to the New World. 
Well, what you don't know is the Mayflower was not their first ship. The first ship was the Speedwell that they paid passage on. And the Speedwell left, and uh, but the problem was, let's see that first slide, uh, she leaked. Speedwell's route is in pink, and she leaked. And she was going to hook up with the Mayflower in England, and then the two of them were going to sail together across the ocean. Well, I can tell you, I've been on the ocean, and you're always better off when there's another boat nearby. And so they were going to sail together. Well, twice their voyage was delayed because the Speedwell kept leaking. And finally they thought they had her fixed, and off they went together, and they got 300 miles out to sea, and the Speedwell and they had to turn back yet again. Frustrated at the delays that they had in getting underway, the Mayflower finally decided to set sail on her own. And so some of the pilgrims gave up and went back home even then, already discouraged because they had tried and tried for weeks and weeks getting off and they kept getting uh, turned back. You know, the will of God is not always the easiest way. And the fact that there's difficulty is not always a litmus test of whether or not you're in the will of God. You can be in the will of God and having a terrible time. Amen. And so they turned, some of them turned back and went home, and others transferred over to the already crowded Mayflower. She was a merchant vessel, generally carried freight, but this time she's carrying mostly passengers. Of the 102 passengers plus crew, only 37 were the separatists, what we think of as the pilgrims, those who left the Netherlands, Christians seeking to come to the new world. Most people assume that everybody on the Mayflower was the Christian pilgrims who were coming to start the new world. No, only about a third of them. And they were plagued with seasickness. They were crossing the Atlantic, and uh, the first half of the journey went pretty smoothly, except they were seasick the whole time. The second half, they were constantly in storms. The trip lasted 66 days. One crew member made fun of them for being sick all the time, and he said, I'll look forward to when y'all die, and I'm going to throw you overboard. He is the only one who died on the voyage oh. over. <laughs> Don't mess with the people of God. <laughs> Second half was perpetual storms. At least twice they had to take down all the sails and let the storm just carry them where it would because it was too dangerous to put up any sail. I've been out in a, in a gale on an ocean in an 80 mile an hour wind and I'll tell you what, it destroys the sails. And so uh, they were smarter than I was. They took theirs down when it started getting that way and, but they had to just let it carry them where it would. So it took them 66 days to get across. They left on September 6, 1620. They spotted land on November 9th of 1620. On the East Coast, they first uh, landed or came into Cape Cod. That was the first land that they spotted. They were, had permission of the king to come to uh, further south into Virginia. To establish a plantation. But they tried twice to sail the south. You can see the blue line, the squiggle. They tried to sail south and the winds were contrary and wouldn't let them get there. So finally they turned north and began to explore the Cape Cod area, finally landing at Plymouth. December 25th, 1620 is when they determined to establish themselves at Plymouth. Now, they didn't even have permission to be there. They were just on their own. And yet, they undertook it. Would you say it went well for them? No, nothing went easy. Nothing was easy. The whole way, struggle. Many of them stayed on the ship for the sake of safety. Some of them uh, went ashore and began to explore the area, trying to establish the, uh, their first buildings. Uh, the fourth slide shows the Mayflower itself that they traveled across it. It was 100, roughly 110 feet long. At its widest point, that would be 80 to 90 feet on deck, and at its widest point, 25 feet wide. 
Four and aft cabins were there for the captain and crew and storage of goods. The middle part where they generally carried the freight is where the passengers lived. Now, we love each other. Amen? Amen. We like getting together. Amen? Amen. Amen? But picture, if you will, <coughs> a place no larger than this, and we're together for over nine weeks, almost nine weeks, eight weeks, and we're covered over, we can't get out. We're all sick. And we're all sick. <laughs> 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 Oh, and add to it, we got 70 visitors that day with us. Now, I love you, but I think it's safe to say nerves would get on edge. Rocking and rolling in storms for weeks, you would have to begin to long since wonder, did we totally miss the will of God? You would have to wonder, is God punishing us for something. Have we done something wrong? But what those pilgrims, and we know from extra biblical, or not extra biblical, but from other historic accounts, we know that those pilgrims during that period went through a lot of confession, getting their lives and relationships right with each other as they got strained, and they had to depend on the Lord such that when they landed... <coughs> When they finally landed, God had usable vessels ready to bring in glory. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Well, once ashore, and by the way, they called the, themselves saints and the other people strangers. And as I say, they were the minority. Once ashore, though, about half the immigrants died during that first winter. Half. They would have all died, likely, except the help of the Indians who taught them how to hunt, uh, how to catch shellfish, how to grow corn, beans, and squash. And to celebrate their first harvest, they had a three-day feast, which we still commemorate today and we call Thanksgiving. I'll tell you that story to say, why, what they have to give thanks for? Half their number died. They had a terrible journey getting across, a terrible first winter, and a really tough time getting started. Folks, we have lost the ability to be truly thankful in every circumstance. It needs to be reclaimed. If you wonder if you've ever lost the discipline of thankfulness in your own life, if you don't believe it, listen to how much you complain to yourself. Are you really walking in the joy of the Lord and giving thanks in all things? Because that is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Remember when Jesus healed the lepers, and only uh, only one of the ten came back and told him thank you. Only one of ten had a thankful heart. Uh, Charles Brown wrote years ago, said the following are nine suggested reasons why they did not return. One waited to see if the cure was real. One waited to see if it would last. One said he would see Jesus later. One decided he had never been, had leprosy. One said he would have gotten well anyway. Perhaps one gave glory to the priest. Or one said, oh well, Jesus really didn't do anything. Another said, any rabbi could have done it. Or another said, oh, I was already much improved. Do you hear the excuses? How often do we find reasons not to give? Does that sound familiar? 48 times in the Bible, the admonition is, give thanks. 2 Samuel 22, 50-51, uh, 
He writes, Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. 1 Corinthians 16, 33 and 34, Paul writes, Then the trees of the wood shall rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. So when should we give thanks? Once a year on Thursday? It ought to be an attitude of gratitude that is always continually exhibited in our lives. Folks, there's not a one of us here who's not richly, tremendously, over-the-top blessed. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 17 through 21 says, Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You, there's always something to thank him for. Always. Tragedy strikes. Lord, thank you for the care that we have available to us. Lord, thank you that you can use this circumstance to your glory. Lord, thank you for entrusting me with this circumstance that I can bring you glory through it. Doesn't mean we like everything that happens. Doesn't mean we even have to pretend to. But folks, we can give thanks for where he has us, the situation we're in, and what he's doing in our life. And when you do, it lightens the burden and gives you victory. So why is giving thanks such a big deal? Why is it so important? There are three things. First of all, giving thanks resets your focus on the provider. Mm -hmm. You ever hear the expression self-made man? Mm -hmm. Did you know there's really no such thing? Mm -hmm. Now I know the president won't say you didn't do that. Well, yeah, you did. But it's God who ultimately <coughs> provides. <coughs> James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Mm -hmm. Having an attitude of gratitude keeps our focus on the provider. Second, giving thanks strengthens your faith. It will help you keep from getting discouraged. If you find something to give thanks for, and you can find something in every circumstance. Psalm 18, 49, 50 David, of course, suffered many things. And he says, Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, sing praises to your name. Great deliverance he gives the king, shows mercy to his anointed. Some of the same verses in Samuel that's repeated in Psalms. Romans, and here's why you can always give thanks. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The doctor says, you've got cancer. The spouse says, I don't love you anymore. The boss says, we're downsizing. Where is God? Doesn't say all things are good. All things aren't good. There's some bad things happening. There's some bad things happening in Paris last week. There's bad things happening even as I speak. There are people who are just out to kill people for no good reason other than it's demonic. That's not good. But we have a promise that God can and will bring good. He will take even the bad things and make them work together for good for those who love him. So an attitude of gratitude strengthens your faith, your ability to trust when bad things come your way. You know, we can sit back and we can start worrying about the future. Now, I don't mean we shouldn't plan for the future. We should. 
But we shouldn't sit around and fret. Oh, I've got the miseries. Oh, I just don't know what we're going to do. I mean, I had a relative once, <coughs> and I loved her to death, but she just, oh, I just don't know what we're going to do. And it didn't, things were going great. I thought, what are you talking about? She just had an attitude that nothing was ever good. And I'll tell you what, that will sap your faith, keep you from ever trusting God, keep you from ever enjoying your salvation. Knowing Romans 8.28 makes it very clear why we can always be thankful. And third, giving thanks gives God glory. You ever seen someone who has the joy of the Lord despite terrible circumstances in their life? Having an attitude of gratitude gives God glory because it proves to others that you're trusting in something or someone bigger than yourself. It's your boldest witness. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Wow. Rejoice in your suffering that you're counted worthy to suffer with Christ. In other words, when God entrusts you with a crisis, it's a compliment. And being thankful in it strengthens your ability and it gives him the glory. You know, we can't, we can't control the, and for lack of a better uh, analogy, the cards were dealt. We can't control the circumstances that come into our life. People die. Jobs get made, jobs get lost. Opportunities come. Cars break down. Things happen. Can't control that. But what we can control is how we respond to it. With an attitude of gratitude, giving thanks glorifies our Father. The thing that we're told everything we do should be to his glory. Jesus said in Matthew 5, and I'm going to read verses 10 through 16 in closing this morning. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm hearing a lot of whining about persecution. It's happening across the seas in horrible ways. All we're getting here is a little discrimination, folks. Now, is it disgusting because of the debate of how our country was founded? Yes, it's disgusting. But I'll tell you what, quit whining. Give thanks that we're counted, that we don't suffer more than we do, and give thanks when we do that God can use it to his glory. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Folks, when we're suffering, we're blessed. And when you're suffering because you sought to follow the Lord and do that which is right, you are richly blessed. Give thanks. It's a badge of honor. Give thanks. It gives him glory. Give thanks. It strengthens your faith. Give thanks. It keeps your focus on him. He goes on to say, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, what we know is that salt doesn't ever really lose its saltiness. What happens? It gets polluted with foreign matter. What's happened to the Church of Jesus Christ in our day in the United States of America, she's largely lost her witness because she has come into worldliness and allowed so much of it into our personal lives, the world can't see enough difference between us and them. 
and it rips apart our witness. And the world's worse off for it. There are things codified into the law today that are reprehensible in the sight of God. And we're horrified, and yet, for years, we said Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. I don't know who said that lie. I know where it came from. It came from the devil himself. But the Christian world and a lot of pastors have fallen into that <laughs> trap. And a lot of what's been codified into law is nobody's fault but our own. Or our own apathy. But it's here. So accept the fact that it's here and be faithful. And stand firm. And when you suffer, continue to give thanks. You are also the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I want to tell you, people out there are scared. People out there are confused. People out there are looking for some direction. And when we go out with an attitude of thankfulness, an attitude that brings glory to our Father, we lift Him up and He draws all to Him. Folks, it's our boldest witness. When the pilgrims established Plymouth, a few years later, there was a writing about them and they were referred to as the city upon a hill. Because they established that plantation, that settlement, for the purpose of being a light for the gospel. And that's why it was referred to as a city upon a hill. And that's referencing our Lord's words. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. Folks, we live in Gallatin, Tennessee. And we can shine his light everywhere we go to the server in the restaurant. Ask her if you have prayer for her today when you bless your food. I don't say she can necessarily stop and pray, but you can say, we're going to pray for our food in a minute. Anything we can pray for you about today? I want to tell you, you're showing an attitude of gratitude. You're fixing to give thanks for your food, and you're giving thanks for her. And your good work is shining into her or his life. And I can't tell you how many times I would say even, even half the time they're in some kind of crisis in their life and they'll share it with you so you can pray for them. We can be the light of the world when we go in the bank and the line's too long. Lord, thank you that the economy's good enough that all these people have banking business today. We can give thanks when some of the grocery store shelves don't have necessarily the brand of soft drink we're looking for. Thank you, Lord, that the economy is good enough that people are able to get what they want. And your needs, needs are so many lives. Not that anybody needs soft drinks, but one of my weaknesses. But there's something you can give thanks for in every situation. <coughs> And when you go through the drive-thru at McDonald's and they mess your order up, say, oh, has that ever happened? Mm, yeah, a lot. <laughs> Give thanks. At least they're trying. Give thanks that you can even be there and have the money to spend. When the tax increase went in last year in our county, one uh, county commissioner made comment, well, that's an increase, but that's not even two Big Macs a month. I was a little upset with that statement because there are a lot of people in our county who can't afford one Big Mac, let alone two. Be thankful that you can even be at McDonald's. Give thanks. Have an attitude of gratitude. And as you do, I'm going to tell you, it's contagious. Don't whine. Shine, my friend David Ring says. Don't whine, but shine. Give thanks and give him glory. Let's pray. Father, 
We praise your name and thank you for your truth and your love. We thank you for our forefathers who suffered to come here. And Lord, we look back on it now and as difficult as their suffering was, we can see that your hand was upon them. And perhaps if nothing else, their suffering serves as an encouragement to us. Not to whine, but to shine. Not to complain, but to give thanks. Oh, Lord, give us grateful hearts. Empower us with hearts of thanksgiving. That we'll bring you glory in all we do. That we will shine as your light for the world to see. Help us, Father, to apply the discipline that can set us free. We ask in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Do you know the Father today?